Ability is what you're capable of doing. Motivation determines what you do. Attitude determines how well you do it. Lou Holtz. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of PodNuts Pro. I am your host, Marvin B. PodNuts Pro is your podcast for IT business support. We share product stories and tips, all in an effort to help you run your business better, smarter, and faster. This is our regularly scheduled Wednesday evening show. We try to come on here each and every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. If you are watching us live, we are streaming both to Facebook and YouTube. If you are listening to audio, thank you very much for downloading and subscribing to the show. If you need any information ever about the show or you'd like to share comments, ask some questions, head over to podnutspro.com and you'll find all the information there about the podcast. You'll find a back catalog of shows. And what I'd like you to do if you're listening in the month of August is click on the tab at the top that says STS Giveaway. That is a giveaway that we are doing to conclude our Summer Tech Series where we had a whole bunch of business owners and technicians come on the show and share some stories from the trenches and talk shop and all that stuff. And we're going to be giving away some great prizes. You don't have to do anything in terms of making a purchase. You don't have to do anything special. You just have to give us your name and email address only so that we can contact you if you are a winner. There are some questions there that I'd like for you to answer and you can help us improve the show. You can tell me what you like, what you don't like, all that good stuff. But podnutspro.com is where you can go to get all that information. Tonight, we have titled the show, Employees, Hire, Fire, and Retire. And I'm joined by a guest, Suzanne Harris from Nexus Tech. You've heard the name before. We've had Bill Wasilius on, the uh, CEO of Nexus Tech. They are a nationwide MSP. They have a ton of employees, so there is going to be a lot of experience there. Suzanne has over 35 years of HR experience, and she has done a lot of leadership stuff, and she has done everything from employee relations, training, development. She's dealt with law and regulatory compliance, compensation, benefits, talent acquisition. Whew, that's a lot of stuff. Suzanne, my goodness. 35 years. You make, I realize how old I am. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I wasn't going to say anything like that. Yeah, I'll uh, say it. Yeah. <laughs> I was just uh, chatting with somebody earlier today. The price of our daily paper is up to $3.50. I'm going to assume that you're like me and you can remember when we had to put a quarter into a (laughs) corner vending machine, right? Sure do. Sure do. A real life quarter. Yep. And you were on the honor system Mm -hmm. to take only one. Take only one. Yep. Exactly. Oh my. So Suzanne, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. All right. So I got corrected earlier. I'm, I apologize, but Nexus Tech is headquartered out of Colorado, but you are mm-hmm. in California. Yes, we have about we have just as many employees in California as we do in Colorado. So I'm in their Irvine, um, California office here in Orange County. Okay. Yeah. Now I assume that your weather out there is just as good as our weather out here. Yes, maybe a little less humidity. But uh, uh-huh. we could use the rain, actually. We don't get much here, and we're kind of in the middle of a drought again. So maybe Florida could send us some of that rain. We could send you, we could send you a hurricane. How, how would that be? Uh, you can skip the hurricane. Because <laughs> <laughs> we are in the midst of our hurricane and rainy season. Yes. Do you have Fred upon you right now, Hurricane Fred? Fred's Is gone. That- 
Fred's, Fred's gone. gone. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the next watching, one's on its way. We're watching the others. They're not really a threat, so mm -hmm. I haven't paid attention. Um, I even forget their names already because that's how that's how into it I am. But Grace and Henry and Linda's in the Pacific running away from you. So yeah, those are our storms. Yeah, Fred is already wreaking havoc up in the northeast. Uh, probably she'd be above Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania area mm. by now. So, but the last three days, we haven't had any rain ever since Fred left. It's been hot and, you know, muggy. Mm -hmm. Even even right now, this late in the evening, it is 87 degrees with a real feel of 93. Mm. Yeah, we've had a pretty mild summer thus far. I'm sure it's going to come. We tend to be a little warmer in September for us, usually, anyway. Yeah. But uh, okay, we, we, we do have pretty mild weather out here. Can't complain. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. So let's go ahead and get rid of these announcements and the news so we can get into this topic. I think we have a lot of stuff to cover in mm -hmm. a short amount of time. Great. So oh, wow. first announcement I want to give is TechCon Unplugged 2021 is going to be held September 17th through the 19th. This is the conference put on by our good friends over at MSP Unplugged, Jeff, John, and Paco. For all the information that you want, head over to techconunplugged.com. The conference is $199, and that includes all of the sessions and your food for the event. You just have to be responsible for your airfare and your accommodations. And I do need to give people, if you just go to the website and try to connect with your hotel room at the wonderful Aloft, you're going to need a super secret decoder sequence to do. You can't just do it on the web because it's going to say that no rooms are available. And if you call the hotel, don't ask for reservations. Ask for sales. They're the ones that know about the TechCon Unplugged conference, and that's how you'll be able to secure your room. So as I mentioned on the last podcast, I am going to be there. I will be there all three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'll be leaving early Monday morning, and we will have a grand old time. And as I mentioned earlier, the Summer Tech Series giveaway over at podnutspro.com slash STS. I did not talk about the prizes, uh, but we're going to have some Amazon gift cards, a firewall, some signed copies of Alan Weinberger's book, The Doctor's In, and a Link Sprinter 300. If you'd like to hear more about that, my previous podcast, uh, episode 356, is an entire show uh, going in deep on the Summer Tech Series podcast. So head over to podnutspro.com slash 356, and that'll be a podcast all about the Summer Tech Series. All right, so that is going to do it for announcements. Let us quickly go into our news segment. And Suzanne, I'm going to ask that you pick a number because I have two Florida stories. And I'd like you to choose which one I read. So you get to choose number one or number two. Let's go with number one. Number one. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. And with that, we are going to go in the news. In our first story, T-Mobile offers free identity theft protection after hackers steal data on millions of customers. T-Mobile will now offer two years of free identity theft protection after hackers stole data on roughly 49 million customers, both real and potential, according to a statement from the mobile carrier. The data breach only became public over the past weekend after hackers offered to sell the data for six Bitcoin or roughly $242,000. T-Mobile first confirmed the data was stolen on Monday, but they did not share at the time what was stolen. While our investigation is still underway and we continue to learn additional details, we have now been able to confirm that the data stolen from our systems did include some personal information. So while T-Mobile says that roughly 49 million bits of information were taken, the hackers say it's closer to 100 million. Thankfully, neither the hackers nor T-Mobile can claim that any credit card information has been compromised. And if you guys really want to know what they're going to offer for protection, 
their two years of free identity protection services is going to be through McAfee's ID theft protection service and will encourage customers to sign up for T-Mobile's account takeover protection service. And they're offering or encouraging everyone to change their PIN numbers. So it's your interesting little tech story for today. And now the Florida story you have chosen. First, I'm going to give you the title for the second story. Netflix filming Florida Man show on North Carolina Beach this week. So that was your option of number two. My option, okay. Yep. Number one, man wears paper bag overhead during town hall meeting. <laughs> so in Pahokee, Florida, which not far from me, the latest town hall meeting in Pahokee took a new turn Monday evening as residents expressed their frustrations with politics. One resident walked to the podium and put a paper brown bag over his head, reminiscent of the fans of the New Orleans Saints in the 1980s. This is merely for demonstrative purposes, said the man. This stands for a fan that has been a longtime fan that at certain times his team disappoints where their performance is so embarrassing that he doesn't want to be known as a team or a fan member. The man said he voted for a diverse commission to be reflective on the community. He said that diversity has a way of making things even. Several other residents followed to express their disappointment with leadership. This after last month, the mayor abruptly adjourned a meeting in which he was being rudely opposed to his stuff. So that is your Florida man story. I was going to show pictures and video with it, but didn't want to do that. So that is this week in the news. All right. So Miss Harris. Yes. When people come to you and chat about HR, how do they usually start? I've got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay. Uh, not always. Not always. But right. uh, sometimes there's a problem they're trying to solve, and it's obviously employee related. So, okay. You know. All right. So we're going to come at it from a little different perspective mm -hmm. and, and hopefully not deal with, you know, disgruntled employees. Right. But, you know, one of the things that I've seen coming out of COVID right now is everybody tries to reopen and stuff. All the companies that had to let go of people mm -hmm. are now trying to rehire. There are also companies that are looking to hire for the very first time. And of course, they always start with, you know, hey, what should I do or who should I hire first or mm -hmm. You know, what steps should I do to right. get a decent, you know, job description out there and stuff like that. So I wanted to, to take this time and do our back to basics feature on all the things that business owners, specifically IT business owners, HR mm -hmm. departments should do through the em entire employee life cycle, which is a new term I learned this week. Yeah. So that um, might be more than one show, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might, it might, yeah, but we can. Go over the basics, that's for sure. Okay. So why don't we do this? I know that there are several people in the chat, and some of the things that you're going to talk about and some of the questions we hope to answer are probably going to be based on the types of people listening. So for people that are currently in the chat, and I see you, Mr. Bull, uh, if you could just briefly, real quick, in the comments section, let us know if you are a solo technician looking to make your first hire. If you are an MSP looking to grow and you've hit a little plateau, maybe you've got, you know, five people in your shop and you, you're you looking to, you know, expand to 10 or something like that. Just give us a real quick idea of what we've got in the audience mm -hmm. and that'll help us guide uh, our questions and stuff through the show. So of course, Suzanne, you know, I am for all practical purposes, even though I have officially three employees, I am a solo tech. I do mm -hmm. all of the, the work myself. I do have subcontractors. I did have full-time techs from 2000 up to 2012. And then I realized I could get more work done remotely than I could sending out yeah. the techs to do the stuff. So mm -hmm. um, 
I will, however, we just expanded our office and business is pretty big um, in the sense that I might need to hire another full-time technician. I know that some of the Facebook groups, that is the thing is, you know, I'm looking to hire, where do I start? Mm -hmm. Well, so. it, it is, it's a really brutal job market right now. You okay. know, probably the toughest I've seen in decades. I don't know if it's a pent up demand post pandemic. I'm not sure. Um, I, I have two recruiters that work on my corporate team. They will tell you the same thing. Even my friends that are external recruiters are, you know, facing the same challenges. So it's important to have a strategy, you know, even if it's just, you know, for one hire, but, you know, lay out your strategy, you know, go over what it is you specifically need. What are the must haves that you need to have in that person? Um, to create that job posting. Your job description should be different than your job posting. Your posting is more of a marketing tool. Um, so you'll want to, you know, create what it is you need in that person. Be very clear, be very specific on what your needs are going to be right down to the technology, you know, technology um, skills they need to have. Okay. So all those okay. posts that we see on Indeed mm -hmm. and all those other ones where basically they do, they list the job description. You're saying that's not the way to go. Well, a job description is usually longer, has a bigger laundry list, has some more legal language in it. Your job posting is more your marketing tool where you take kind of your must-haves. You have a statement at the top that kind of explains your brand. And you, you really want to be able to grab their attention quickly. They have short attention spans. They're not going to, you know, read through a very long job description you take information from that job description you create that job posting but you know have a brief um, impactful statement about your company at the top and then get right to the to the meat of everything this is the role this is a report to and this is the must-haves for this role to be successful um, use a title that makes sense use words in that job posting that will show up in filters and be easily um, get the attention easily of potential candidates. I see sometimes people kind of make up these fancy titles and they don't really, you know, people are scanning job postings. They don't really know what that means, but you're going to have to spread your net far and wide. You know, use all your LinkedIn connections, use your social media contacts to really get that word out there. We find LinkedIn and indeed our postings there to be the most successful. Oh, okay. So that was going to be obviously one of the questions mm -hmm. as to where do you post? And, mm -hmm. you know, the joke is, you know, don't ever post on Craigslist. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but then somebody <laughs> says, oh, I found a great person on Craigslist. You know, sometimes you do. Sometimes you do. But, uh, you know, not only just important to get the word out there and get the posting out there, but then from that point, what's going to be, say, your selection strategy, your interview strategy? Do you have some screening questions? that uh, are important. Um, who's going to do the technical interview? Who's going to do the interview? Create kind of a competency scorecard so that you are um, basing, um, you know, as you're interviewing, you're basing everybody on the same competencies to eliminate any bias and to really make sure you give yourself the best chance to get the best candidate for the position. Okay. So just to give you an idea, so a couple of people have responded and mm -hmm. we've got uh, one here who's got six techs, one admin, and <laughs> one owner. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll what he says there. And then another that's got a full-time tech and a part-time customer service. And mm -hmm. uh, actually listed another question that might uh, come in having mm -hmm. issues locating part-time on Indeed, ZipRecruiter, blah, blah, blah. ZipRecruiter, we find um, it depends on the position. Sometimes we're successful. Sometimes we are not. Um, you can post for part-time. I saw his question there. Sometimes a part-time role might be good to go to a tech college or a local community college to maybe perhaps find somebody who's a good student in IT, has, has already self-taught themselves, has a little bit of experience that maybe want a part-time position to work around their school schedule. That's a good uh, um, place to look there. Okay. So <clears throat> let me go, let me ask another question that will kind of tie into that. So in terms of, where'd my question go? Uh, maybe I didn't write it down. Maybe it was in my head. <laughs> so 
um, you mentioned uh, the places to do, and we mentioned the job description and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how do you write a good job description that goes along with a good posting? So you mentioned, you know, have the nice title, mm -hmm. have it truly be reflective of your brand and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But if, you know, if you're like me, you know, I can't say like me, I've already hired people, but you know, when I go to hire my mm -hmm. next person again and I put something out there, you know, what are some things that, you know, somebody like me should do in putting that posting out and putting in that job description, what it is that I want the person to do? Yeah, you know, you, you want to grab their attention. Like I said, candidates, especially if they're looking, they have short attention spans. They're not going to read through a lot. They want, you know, so have, you know, show, use this as an opportunity to um, show off your brand, you know, short, impactful statement about your company, maybe even their, your size. Hey, we're, you know, growing MSP, looking to add to our, you know, fantastic team. Clearly define what you need, though. Be specific. Don't bury it in a lot of jargon. Get right to the point about what the role is, what the experience should be, and and what technologies they they need to have you know relevant experience in. Um, personalize it. You know, some people refer to the qualified candidate should have personalize it. Make it you know you should have these experience and these um, technologies or skills. Obviously. Be sure you don't use any discriminatory language or anything that would be off-putting. You know, I've seen crazy things like, you know, uh, young, attractive woman wanted for receptionist, you know, things like that. You don't want to put anything about even using words like energetic individual that might, you know, show ageism, you know. So be careful about those kinds of, of words and language. But make sure you've got words in there that, you know, the, the title is good, words that will an SEO will pick it up in their filters. You know, specific technology, specific skills that will will stick out if you're doing, you know, filtered a filtered search. Now, do you? And I'm, I mean, I'm asking you questions that you don't have to answer, but I know that mm -hmm. one of the big things is I know people always look for the bottom line. So, do you put information in there about salary? You know, you, you probably best to put a range in there. Some states, like Colorado, now um, you're required to put the range in there. Okay. So, you know, if you don't want to get too specific for purpose, you know, whatever your reasons are, but at least maybe put in a range, but that does sometimes help you eliminate candidates that are either too, you know, too far outside of that range due to their, you know, long experience or something, save them time and save you time. But it does make sense to put, you know, a good range in there. Okay. Now you mentioned Colorado requires that. It sounds like mm -hmm. other states do not. So how do you handle posting for multi-states. I know that Nexus Tech is mm -hmm. across the nation, so you've got several states that you have to worry about. Do you have to, you know, be really specific based on the state? Well, it's interesting because we do a lot of remote hiring. And so because that role isn't specific to Colorado, we aren't, you know, um, complying with that law specifically because, you know, unless it's a role right in Colorado, most of our roles are remote anymore. We don't necessarily put in that range or you'll put in a, a range so wide that, you know, which isn't always helpful either. But I know, I think it was Johnson and Johnson. I'm thinking it was a very large company anyway, that actually would put in their job posting, except we will not hire. We, you know, this remote position is remote except we're in Colorado so they could get around putting those ranges in there. Mm, okay. So people find the trick. So it's a brand new law it was just in effect this January. I'm not sure, you know, how closely they're monitoring it. So we're just being very careful with that. Just use, either using a wide range or we're just saying it's remote USA and, and not making it Colorado specific. Okay. Do you sometimes find a difference in philosophy when you're hiring for a technician versus an admin or other type of position? Do you change the philosophy on how you post those jobs? You know, great question, but no, I don't, I don't see that we do. We're just, like I said, we have a very impactful branding statement and, and we're very clear on the roles and, and personalize it, you know, the posting a little bit and, um, and don't make any real specific changes other than when it's a tech role, we'll make sure that, we, that the technologies they need to have experience in are very clear. Okay. All right. So one of the questions that we got ahead of time from some listeners mm -hmm. that helped me out is 
do you use software to onboard, offboard, et cetera? You know, we, we have over 300 employees. So we have a, you know, a big HR information system. It's got the payroll, the HR database, time and attendance, recruiting module. We've got all that built in. I'm a big fan of using HR technology to streamline. But I understand when you, you, you know, some of these MSPs are, are small, that's not, co- you know, it's cost prohibitive and you, it's, you don't need that much horsepower. But um, there are some software programs. I don't have personal experience with them. One of them is, uh, and they didn't tell me to plug them. I don't even know anybody there, but there's like Bamboo HR, Zenefits, Benefits with a Z that, uh, that can be pretty cost um, effective for very small companies to assist with onboarding, document signing, things of that nature to assist so that you remain compliant, with, especially with, you know, things like your Form I-9, things of that nature. Okay. Do you ever get asked by smaller people to help? Meaning like, you know, a small MSP that, you know, maybe doesn't have the resources to, you know, the owner doesn't want to be the person that's putting in the ad and doing the interviewing and stuff. Um, do you ever get asked for help with that on how to, how to guide them? Oh, occasionally, yeah. I have friends with, you know, small businesses or something. They'll ask me to take a look at their job posting, make sure it sounds okay and they didn't miss anything or have language in there they shouldn't. You know, I'll give it a quick glance and, and kind of guide them. Okay. Now, you mentioned that you have inside recruiters. Mm-hmm. So for companies that are not able to have that, right? Uh, when is a good time to get a recruiter? Well, you mean have your own internal one, a corporate one? Well, if you've probably got, you know, 10 or more openings, seven or more openings at any, you know, consistently, I think that's probably a good time, especially if they're roles that can be challenging to fill, um, especially in a market like this. Um, You know, external recruiters, um, I have mixed feelings about them. They um, may be very helpful if it's a really difficult, role to find, but um, I think just on your own, you, you can do a good job of recruiting if you just, you know, set out a strategy and, and go about it methodically. All right. Now, I have been approached by a couple of people saying, hey, we'll help you get a tech and stuff. So mm-hmm. that's what you're talking about, that they can be helpful in specific situations, but not all. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, of course, I get you know, calls a lot too from external recruiters, but you know, I've got two full-time people out there recruiting. And so they're using all the same tools and everything that an external recruiter is using as well. So, um, you know, for us, it makes more sense economically to have those folks in house, but um, you know, I would certainly uh, try it on your own first because you might find that you will have just as much success than a, you know, an external recruiter. I think people think they've got this, you know, bench of A players ready to go. And they're out there searching and talking to people just as like you would be as you look for a candidate. Okay. And they're costly. So, you know, if it's a a critical role you can't find, you may have to get that support from an external recruiter. Right. So I just rattled off a ton of questions at you. You you have any questions for me? You want to take a break? How do you want to? (laughs) I'm doing okay. You know, so far it's not, you know, not a, too tough a crowd, right? I probably have some Nexus Tech folks out there listening. You know, I brought my own fan club just in case the crowd got rough. So yeah, yeah, they they hit me up on LinkedIn pretty. Uh, did they? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they did. Oh, good. So let's go back to, you know, we're talking about you know hiring and all of that. So let's talk about. I know that we're in a weird climate right now. Mm-hmm. So has there been a change in what employees or prospective employees are looking for in terms of benefits and stuff like that. I know that there's mm-hmm. probably a bigger push to work right. remote, but is mm-hmm. there anything else that has changed with what they're looking for? Definitely remote work. Mm-hmm. Definitely remote. And that has helped us from a recruiting perspective to kind of tie it into that, that basically our labor pool now is nationwide. We used to hire more location specific. We have six offices. But now being able to hire remotely, that is that has helped us with our recruiting. So 
to your question, benefits, people are seeing that as a benefit. There are some people that aren't even returning to their old jobs that are requiring them to go to the office. They want the remote work. They want that work-life balance. They don't want to spend an hour in their car. That's become very important to them. Benefits, you know, it's always good to have a good benefits program. I know many of you are small, and that may be, again, cost prohibitive. Um, but of course, you know, medical, dental, vision, those types of benefits are, are, are pretty important. And if you're not able to offer them, you, you may have to get a little creative, perhaps in, your, in the total compensation package that you offer them in order to get that talent. So I know in Florida, it is very difficult if you are under three to offer something. It's almost like they got mm -hmm. rid of all the small group plans mm -hmm. and made it very difficult. And I was just talking to another person um, who's actually a very decent sized law firm where they have to relook at insurance and it's, it's doubled yeah, since it's, January. It has. Now, I don't know if Florida has a state exchange like we have in California where someone could perhaps buy it you know, a single policy through the exchange, and perhaps you could have some sort of benefit stipend that you offer them. Perhaps they, um, not that you would want to put this in your, you know, job posting, but if they're able to get benefits maybe through a spouse, perhaps you could again help them with the cost of that. You know, try and find, you know, a way around it as much as you can, or it may just be more that you have to put in there, you know, some sort of base pay or give them a stipend for them to, towards purchasing it on their own. Or you can go to what's called many of you, if you know, I'd like to hear if any of you are using one currently or I've heard of one. It, it, they're called a PEO, a professional employer organization. ADP has them, many of the big players do, um, where basically you have a shared employee, employer relationship and they're able to, like I said, you use your same tax ID number, you, you still have your company name, but basically they pull you with all these other employees so that you can get, you know, large group rates for benefits for a very small group. Mm. I know ADP is a product called total source. So that's an option too. When you start getting at maybe five, 10 employees that that could be pretty cost effective for you. And they'd help you a lot with uh, the HR functions and onboarding as well. All right. That sounds interesting. I know when I mm -hmm. were, when I had my techs, I actually just split 50, 50 with them. Mm -hmm. which uh, is pretty hefty down here. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is really climbing, especially when you get into dependent costs and, you know, coverage. I mean, that may be completely, you know, cost prohibitive for a small organization to offer, but uh, if you can maybe figure out a way to at least cover them on at least a, a good medical plan, that would be, you know, in this job market, you're, you're probably going to have to get a little creative okay. in order to get the candidates. So, so for those situations where you've got that in California, mm -hmm. so which state does the umbrella for all your stuff fall under? Is it Colorado where the headquarters are, or is it the state that the employee is in? The state that the employee is in. Okay. Yes. So we've kind of created our policies as such. You know, we kind of follow California and Colorado since they have some pretty strict policies um, and kind of use that. We mentioned in our employee manual, if they're in another state, the states of that state will apply. But um, yeah, it is where the employee um, resides and is located. All right. So I'm going to shift gears here real quick because I want to go back to the fact that you said a lot of people are looking to work remote. So what types of challenges or fun have you had <laughs> in onboarding an employee out of state? Well, you know, what the, probably the biggest challenge is, you know, one, you, we don't get to meet them in person. It's always nice to, you know, to have them come in and, and meet coworkers and that. So we're very good about using collaborative tools to make sure that we um, meet them, um, at least by video, getting equipment to them, shipping equipment to them, and, uh, of course, making sure that all the doc documents and that are signed. Like I said, we have a big ADP system. So, you know, they're able to electronically sign everything, but, you know, making sure that they have that, um, that their manager is being collaborative with them 
using, you know, video training and that, because otherwise, you know, you just have this new employee sitting out in the middle of Michigan somewhere at their dining room table with their laptop. You know, you, you have to make sure that they feel included in that from day one, you've got a training program, be very inclusive with them with team meetings so that they feel a part of your company quickly. So it takes a little more work because they're not right there in person. All right. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, Anything new that you've had to do because of COVID policy wise or. Well, you know, when COVID first hit a year and a half ago, we had uh, seven offices. And so, you know, California set some pretty strict mandates. Everybody, pretty much 95% of the company went remote. So getting everybody set up, especially our non-tech employees, getting them set up quickly. So, you know, that was a challenge. And then, of course, creating policies as to who could come in the office if they did indeed um, get COVID the communication that they had to let us know um, so that we could make sure, because we have some techs that go on site. So we had to work with our clients on what their policies were as well. Whether they were going to allow the tech in the office or if the tech was allowed in, did they have to glove up, mask up? So we've just paid attention to the state mandates where we have employees and, and, you know, followed them, but it, it did take some work. All right. I imagine that you had some places that were kind of like, oh, we're fine. Come on in. And then you had others that were, right. you know, have signs on the door of masks required. Tex and Yeah, because we have employees in Texas, you know, and uh, they weren't worried about masks. But then we have <laughs> we have 80 employees in California and you couldn't leave your house without a mask. So right. we all in Colorado had some pretty strict rules as well. So we had to constantly review those new mandates to make sure we were complying. Bill would send out, Bill Vasilius, our CEO, would send out a weekly memo to update the employees on, on the situation. You guys don't have an office here in Florida yet, do you? No, but you know what? We have like 18, 19 employees in Florida now. We used to have like five, and it's grown to about 18 or 19 employees spread throughout the state, so we should get an office there soon. But then Probably again, should. you know, people aren't, leasing real estate they're just letting them all work from home so that's what we've been doing it's a lot of empty space down here maybe you know yeah something for i got a little i got a thousand square feet i could uh, well you know what we may put them there <laughs> they're they, you know they're from the panhandle all the way down to miami and everywhere in between all right so um yeah florida's, but, uh, florida's a long state so yeah our florida employee base is, has been our fastest growing that in texas all right so i know a question that i got in uh, you mentioned handbook earlier and policies and stuff for smaller companies. What should be the point where you have a employee handbook? I know mm -hmm. that when I did it, you know, I had, so I had two full-time techs and an admin person and I started to write my handbook, but I never finished it. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> I would imagine that you should have that fully intact, right? Right. Well, you know, you're not legally required to have an employee manual, but it's a responsible thing to do. And, you know, if you've just got a few employees, you don't need to write a book, so to speak. Um, you know, there, there's lots of templates you can find and kind of fill in the blanks and that may work for you. But you, you, you want to make sure you've got policies that are written around, um, you know, your, your time off policies, your time and attendance policies, your your code of conduct that you require, at least get those basic policies in there, even if it's half a dozen pages and make sure they sign it. You can always add to that employee manual, but if you're taking on your first employer, you've got just two or three, just make sure you cover those, those important, those important items that uh, if you do have to say, um, discipline somebody, document something, you can at least show the, the policies that they've, perhaps violated or were, you know, not following. So I found that most of <laughs> my clients usually have the policies as the disciplinary book that they go by. Um, it's yeah. always, you know, in regards to, you know, mm -hmm. you can't work overtime and, and, mm -hmm. you know, we are able to monitor your internet activity and mm -hmm. you know, going to unauthorized sites is, grounds for, you know, discipline, blah, 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 yeah. and all of that. But what are 
kind of the best and legal ways to go about either, you know, whether using an employee handbook or not, but, you know, once you've got the employee, you know, what, what legally can you do for those types of disciplines? Well, if I understand your question correctly, if someone's not performing, um, with or without a manual here, but, you know, um, either attendance is poor, they're, they're failing to follow through on the job, there's client complaints. The best thing to do is, I always say, you know, prepare, be fair, and deliver. Write out specifically what they have done. For an example, if they are missing work, don't just write it up and state, you're always late, you, you always miss work. Be specific. On such and such days, you had, un, you know, un, um, unscheduled unexcused, you know, unscheduled, you were late, be very specific and bring it to their attention pretty quickly. I mean, maybe you don't need to do it as a write-up, but keep notes on the situation. So that if it does reach that point where you've got to get a, you know, a write-up in front of them and get them to sign it, you've got the details. You want to just clear the who, what, when, where, those types of facts in there. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can defend that. Do you ever have to, I'm trying to think of a situation that a client is dealing with. And so I'm trying to be gentle in how I say this. Okay. Um, they are in a battle with an employee because they don't want to make it appear to be a diversity issue, but yet it is a performance issue. And they did not have clear guidelines on how to gauge employee performance. Um, I'm assuming that it would obviously have been best to have those guidelines in place ahead of time. But I think a lot of times the employer feels at a disadvantage when they're dealing with certain situations because they're always afraid of the legal ramifications. I mean, employee gets let go. And in mm -hmm. Florida, you know, not only is it a right to work state, but it's a right to sue state. And right. people sue for just about anything. Well, all the more reason to make sure that you're you're documenting, you know, if, if you have just even a, a spreadsheet or a Word document where, you know, you're just putting in notes. And like I said, be very specific so that you have to defend any claim. You have that. Um, you know, certainly if you've got the attendance problem or it gets worse, certainly create a performance memo or performance improvement situation that they have to sign off on. But the more documentation that you have, that's what you're going to need. You know, they can sue, but if you have what you need to defend yourself. And of course, always be careful of, you know, discrimination and, and things like that or the appearance, the appearance of it. But if you treat everyone equally, hold them to the same standards, document them, when they're not meeting those standards and you do it fairly and across the board and you keep that uh, documented, that's your best defense. All right. Okay. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want, but I mean, I just know from experience, just I've trained managers on that all the time is, you know, to keep those notes. You know, I've many times in the past, I've had someone come to me and say, Oh, this employee, I've, I've got to terminate him. Well, there, you have no, Nothing documented about his performance. You gave him a glowing performance review six months ago because you didn't want to, um, you know, create any conflict. And now it's reached this point where you can no longer tolerate it. You've got nothing to back up or support your your claim of their, you know, not performing. So very important. All right. So any notes that you've taken down that you wanted to go over before I keep asking questions <laughs> you can you can keep answer, answering questions i'm i'm curious though i don't know if they can put in the chat but i'm assuming what we talked about too is you know that your your listeners are if they have been out there trying to hire they're finding some of the same challenges that everyone is in this job market I, so you know i know that i don't know if, if you're listening and you can you know <laughs> add to that please do i know that when i've either had discussions with other techs or been a part of discussions on the Facebook or, or any of those places, a lot of it always seems to be that the expectations are not being met. 
Now, part of that could be what you mentioned earlier, where, you know, the employer is not very specific about what they're hiring. They Mm -hmm. just, you know, for instance, probably most of the texts are, hey, I need a, I need a part-time or a full-time tech to take Mm -hmm. care of all my overflow work. And, you know, I need a tech that's got two years of experience, Mm -hmm. knows Microsoft Office, Windows 10, and can handle Office 365 Mm -hmm. stuff. But in our world, that's not it. There's so many other things that come along with it. So, you know, it's that question of how do you, especially if you're starting out, if you're, you know, looking to get that first or second tech, Mm -hmm. or even if you're looking to hire an admin person first, I know that some people, you know, from my perspective, if I were to do it all over again, I wouldn't have hired a tech first. I'd hire an admin person Mm -hmm. first. Right. A lot of admin work. You know, well, and- you know, like I mentioned, you know, be very clear in your expectations in the job postings, the must haves, the nice to haves. And if if you do hire an employee and, and you know, within a month or two, it, they're not meeting expectations. There's a couple of things, you know, one, you might need to take a hard look at yourself. And what I mean by that is, did I give them the proper onboarding? Did I give them the proper training? Was I very clear in these expectations? that I I needed from them? Was I unrealistic during my hiring process? Sometimes what you might need to do is I call it kind of hitting the reset button. You might sit down with them with another expectations letter and say, we're kind of falling short of expectations. I'll own what I need to, but you know, Mr. and Mrs. Employee, I need you to, to kind of, you know, step up and we're falling short here in these areas and coach them to improve. If, if that doesn't work, then, you know, you might have to go to plan B, but sometimes you have to take a hard look at yourself too, to make sure you gave them the, the skills and the opportunity to succeed. All right. <clears throat> Let me turn the question around, you know, for a company that is, you know, 300 strong, the, the, the thought pattern would be, well, you, you probably have a ton of people looking to work at your place. And how do you, you know, you don't have to put in those types of specifics and you don't have to attract them. They're already coming to you. So how do you handle that? Well, you know, you make a good point, but this has been um, the last six months of we've experienced that same difficult job market. Okay. We, we get, we certainly get uh, candidates, but a big 300 person company isn't always right for everybody. Some want to work for a, a small, smaller company. They're not, you know, be a a bigger fish in the pond, so to speak. But this past six months, we have had a higher rate of uh, declined offers. And uh, those that we've even made an offer to, they've accepted and come back and uh, backed out of it because they got a better offer. So we're experiencing those same things in this market. You know, our roles aren't what are right for some people aren't right for others. So um, it's not always easy for us either. Okay. Can you, without getting specific, can you talk about the, I guess, the categories of why those declines are happening? Is it, you know, is it the remote work? Is it salary? Is it something else? Well, um, we've been offering quite a bit of remote work, so that hasn't been the problem. Some of them are just getting um, more money. Mm. Um, Some companies, um, which is deeper pockets, will throw more money at them and money talks. Um, some of them, it might just be a, a, a job that's a higher level for them than we had to offer at that point. They, they, they see a different career path there. There's a multitude of reasons, but I'd probably have to say number one is they've, uh, you know, either taken it for money or we've had, you know, some, I, I kind of always communicating with the hiring managers for them to be a little more swift in their process because the candidates are going fast. So sometimes it's just they're slow in their process and the candidate got snapped up snapped up and they pulled themselves out of the, you know, running Hmm. before we could even get a chance to give them an offer. Okay. I didn't even think about that. So a firm Mm -hmm. your size probably would have a long process, especially if you have a recruiter Mm -hmm. that is recruiting, then you get them in the, in the the funnel, I guess, Mm -hmm. to, um, to that first interview. And I'm assuming there's what, two or three interviews at least. Well, you know, it depends, you know, um, our, our manager of talent acquisition, Samantha Hayes, does a great job. She consults with these hiring managers and tells them that, you know, you got to tighten up your process. You can't, I'm going to do, you know, 
first interview this Monday and I'm going to do my second interview two weeks from now, tighten that up. So we're kind of working with them and making them understand to, to follow the process, but be quicker about it because that's where they're losing candidates is when they wait too long between interviews or they have too many interviews. So I would imagine that right now, a lot of people looking for work mm -hmm. have been out of work for a while. So yeah, they're probably looking for, you know, I got to start mm -hmm. soon. I can't wait yeah. two weeks between interviews to. In the IT space, I don't, we're, you know, my recruiting team, they, they don't just wait for applications to come in. They're out there, you know, uh, reaching out to passive candidates all the time as well. But uh, I think, you know, IT especially, they pretty much, most of them remain pretty employed throughout this pandemic. They've either worked in essential businesses. So um, we don't find that there's many of them out there, you know, sitting there unemployed waiting for us to find them. Okay. A question did come into the chat. Mm -hmm. It's going to change our direction here, but how do you handle pay raises when you are a small operation? Could you maybe be more specific about the question, like how frequently you give them or address it or, you know? Well, let's see. So David, if you could mm -hmm. expand more. So David is the one who mentioned that uh, one full-time tech himself is a tech and a part-time customer service. Mm -hmm. So I know that when, when I was going through this, so I did, <laughs> he says typing. Um, so I did a multi-layered approach. So I did an initial salary mm -hmm. with a bump after my 90 day probation period. Mm -hmm. And then it was annual. And there was a combination of the what is it? The COLA, the cost of living, living. increase, mm -hmm. um, as well as a performance increase. Mm -hmm. yep. So if, you know, my person was productive and was mm -hmm. making us faster in our processes to where we could, you know, mm -hmm. be more efficient, make more money, then they maybe got a little higher increase. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Now that was in the beginning. Now what I did was I kind of backed that off because I wanted the salary to kind of slow down and I would give a bigger bonus at the end of the year mm -hmm. if we had a good year because I couldn't guarantee that right. the next year was going to be as good. Right. And that can be a discretionary bonus. Like you said, based on how well you've done, once you increase their pay, you're, you know, you can't go back. You can't go back. However, you know, it is important to, to do your homework and make sure you are paying competitive wages or you're going to, you're going to incur the cost of turnover. And that's right. costly too. So one point, just bringing this up, you talk about pay and that, that I, I want to point out is it's really important. Um, this is one way that companies can run afoul of the IRS pretty quickly and penalties is making sure that you classify your employees hourly or salary, you know, non-exempt, exempt correctly. Just paying them a salary alone does not qualify them to necessarily be an exempt salaried employee. So that's, in, that's important to, to consider and put can, it. Can you sorry. explain that? Because I know that that's something in Florida, there is a place where you can check a person as exempt or, and give them a salary or have them mm -hmm. pay a wage. And I know that I don't pay as much attention to it as I should, but I know that there's a couple of my clients where they they keep track of hours so tightly, even though they'll pay somebody a salary, they're supposed to work 40 hours, but they only will work 35 and then they have an hour lunch each day. So that's their 40. So if they actually work, you know, 42, it's really 37. Um, so what does exempt mean in that? And how does that, translate to this 40 hour. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of misunderstandings around that. So exempt salaried employee is that you're paying them a salary um, to work, but they have to qualify their, their duties and responsibilities have to meet that criteria to be an, a salaried exempt employee. Meaning um, in the tech space, this is just real um, kind of a brief way to describe it. If it's a tech who is, designing the infrastructure, deploying the infrastructure, and has the skill set, and you have to pay a, 
a um, the salary must be a, a there's a minimum salary each state has a different one um, they have to be paid that minimum salary and they have to be like I said doing technology work that is considered exempt like I said more of your design infrastructure deployment if they're doing more of the maintaining of the systems that falls into a non-exempt hourly category. So you would be, you'd have to abide by the overtime rules. And that's a place where people run afoul. Just sent, giving someone a salary doesn't mean automatically that they qualify. And by, But then if you have a salary, you don't want to track their hours. You're paying them. So here's even a better way to simplify it. An hourly employee is paid for every hour of productivity. A salaried employee is paid to do the job. That job might be 50 hours one week. They it might be you know 38 hours the next, but you're paying them a weekly salary. That be, that probably is going to open up a can of worms here, and I can see the questions coming. But <laughs> it's just really important that you classify those employees correctly. Okay. Okay. So we're going to have to uh, yeah I, that, dig that more would, into that because yeah and, and I and I knew it as I was saying it yeah. because I know here it's a huge thing where. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you, you pay somebody a salary, mm -hmm. but then you're counting their hours and exactly. most people, there's a lot of, you know, let's just say legal secretaries, which is a different mm -hmm. category than tech, right. but they're like, you're paying me a salary. Why do you have to count my hours? And, and you shouldn't, if you're paying them, if they truly qualify for a salaried exempt role, you don't want to start tracking their hours because if they, they could challenge you, they could come back to you. They could file a claim and say, you know, you kept track of all my hours here and here's where I had all this extra hours and now I, I should get overtime. You were tracking my hours like an hourly employee. Mm. Where's my overtime? So you want to be really clear on those distinctions and that they do indeed meet those criteria for being in those, you know, classifications. Okay. All right. So David did uh, type some more stuff and mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to say right here that if you're listening to the audio, I'm going to apologize because we're going to address this in the post show uh, because it looks like it's going to dig deep unless Suzanne, you think you can answer it quickly. David says that uh, they are paid hourly. I was thinking of giving raise at the end of the year of employment, just not sure how to calculate it. And then he said he had past employees who didn't seem to appreciate a slight raise. So curious for other benefit ideas to offer. I see what you're saying. Sometimes people, you give them a small raise that, that feels like a slap in the, a bigger slap in the face and not giving them anything at all. But perhaps um, you could work with them on um, maybe some more job flexibility. If you know this one or two employees and what's maybe important to them, maybe you could offer them um, I don't know if you're offering them currently, you know, paid time off, maybe an additional uh, PTO day, maybe an additional holiday. In addition to that pay increase, maybe just get a little creative. As uh, Marvin mentioned earlier, maybe a bonus program if if certain uh, profitability uh, marks are, are hit. So, um, you know, if, if you've got just one or two folks, you should probably know what's kind of more important to them, money or time off or, or, or maybe a stipend towards some benefits, but maybe you could get a creative and, and maybe work all those together to find something that would uh, satisfy your budget and also make them feel appreciated and, uh, and rewarded. All right, David, let us know if we answer that mm -hmm. for you or if we need to continue to address yeah. it in the post show, but mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm going to let us end right there. So if you okay. are watching the video here, we will be back and continue our discussion. If you're listening by audio, uh, thank you very much for downloading and subscribing and listening. But this is the reason why you may want to take some time and join us Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. and get a little more deeper into the conversation. So Suzanne, thank you very much for hanging out. I know that it was basically question after question and that's fine. I said it wasn't going to be the Larry King show, but <laughs> oh, this it's... is much better than Larry King. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. As we end off here, let me go back and ask, is there anything that you wanted to ask me uh, in relation to this topic before we end off? <laughs> was that a question for me? Yes. 
yeah, you know, I know you've got 35 years of HR experience, but you know, anything you want to ask me? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I do because I, I realize, you know, having worked for companies of, of this size for a long time, I, I feel for you. I can understand what those challenges must be like for, for companies your size every day. So what, what, you know, do you have any, what has been your biggest employee challenge? And when you've had those two folks, what, what was really, you know, the most, uh, that, you know, what you struggled with the most? Well, it was interesting because I think in terms of at getting what I wanted, mm -hmm. you know, I never had an issue with getting resumes and getting interviews and people that wanted to work. The, the compensation that I offered was, was fair. Mm -hmm. Um, the only two real issues that I ran into was I had one employee that, you know, as David mentioned, wanted a bigger raise, mm -hmm. but didn't do the work mm -hmm. to, you know, make that worthwhile for me. Right. And so that was the one thing. The other thing was, and, and this is probably more of a Florida issue mm -hmm. where laziness is a big issue down here where, uh, techs, there were jobs back in the nineties and early two thousands where, you know, techs could make a lot of money mm -hmm. doing, a, doing a little work. And that started to change to where, yeah. you know, you couldn't just get away <clears throat> with, you know, doing a job or right. two a day and, and, you know, making good money. And of course, I think the schools kind of did us a disservice by saying that, you know, go get your degree and you'll make 60,000 coming out of college. Right. Right. When they, they have no experience or real world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that was probably, those were the things yeah. where you know, those expectations mm -hmm. of, you know, the raise and, you know, yeah, I, I came, I became a tech because I could make a lot of money, but not have to work. And, yeah. you know, I want to clock out at five o'clock where or go surfing or something. Right. Yeah, in our world, five o'clock, you know, doesn't exist. No, it's a twenty-four-seven business. Yep. All right. Yeah. Well, all right. We are going to continue on, folks. So before we do, this is normally the time of the show, Suzanne, where I would ask you if you would like to challenge Florida man or answer a random question. So, do you have any stories out in California that? Uh, you would think as weird as California is that I could come up with something really quickly. I can't. It's funny. I was telling you that we had a radio DJ here for several years. He had a segment of a show and it was called weird, weird Florida stories. And I can't even remember any of them. And, but so I'm just going to have to take the random question, I guess. Okay. All right. So let me get my random question generator here. Oh, this is kind of scary. I mean, <laughs> All right. Um, let me go here. And so I'm going to click. All right. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, you actually have a program that generates these questions. It's, you it's, a, with it's a website. It's oh, okay. Just, um, <laughs> and here's the question. Okay. What smell always brings back some type of memory? Okay. Um, that's pretty easy for me. My dad was an asphalt cowboy. He was a long distance trucker oh. and I love to go on the trucks with him in the summertime. So the smell of diesel fuel diesel reminds fuel. me of my dad. Yeah. See, that was easy. Yeah, that was easy. Yeah. I was afraid it'd be something really, you know, so, terrifying, but that was simple. So what types of, did he have the same routes that he did or did he have different routes? He had different routes. Um, he had a, you know, Peterbilt and he'd run a lot from San Diego to Edmonton, Canada. He um, hauled uh, produce. So he had to be timely because it was a re you know, refrigerated truck, but he'd run East coast to West coast and from the South all the way up into Canada. So yeah, he was all over. And you went with him. Yes, my sisters and I would, uh, you know, travel with them during the summers. That was the way we got to see the United States from sitting up in the, you know, in an 18-wheeler, hanging out at truck stops. <laughs> now, did he have one of the sleeper cabs or did you? It was just a small, it's a very small, you know, not one of these fancy ones they have now. But I, I have two sisters and we'd all cram into there in that sleeper and you know, sleep. He didn't have a co-driver. When I got older, I learned how to drive and would drive with him. 
Oh, um, there we go. So, yeah, how I went from truck driving to HR, I, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> nice. um, but it was great, you know, when you're a young kid and you know to see the country that way, that was pretty fun. So I have, yeah. yeah. So we'll have to talk about that after the show because I drove Greyhound buses for a while. So. Did you? Okay. Yes. Right. You used to see a lot of them out on the road. Yeah. yeah. So we'll chat about that. So, sure. ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for downloading and subscribing once again to this episode of Podnuts Pro. We are here, as I mentioned, each Wednesday, 8 p.m., mm -hmm. as much as we can be if you want to join us live. Or you can always subscribe or follow is the new term now. Find your favorite podcatcher mm -hmm. in iTunes, Google, Spotify, or whatever, and, and uh, subscribe mm -hmm. to the show there and get alerted when new episodes are out. Or you can head over to podnutspro.com, find our back catalog of episodes. And of course, you can check out our sponsors and affiliates. You can shop in the Amazon store and help support the show. Mm -hmm. You can donate. And of course, click on the STS giveaway to win a chance at some Amazon gift cards or link printer and all the other great prizes there. So that is going to do it. I'd like to say thank you to Suzanne Harris for hanging out with us and answering all these weird HR questions. You're welcome. It was fun. And if you are still with us in the chat, uh, stay with us through the video and we will continue on for everyone else. Thank you for joining us. Good night. And we will see you next time on Podnuts Pro. Thank <laughs> you.